Hello, it's your host, Todd Lewis, uh, the Praise of Folly podcast. Today I'm joined by Lear Keith, is that right? Lear, it rhymes with Pierre. Oh, That's Pierre, right. Lear Keith, okay. Yeah, Lear right. Keith. Uh, she might be known from her appearance on Stephen Crowder's uh, Louder with Crowder and also her documentary that she was in, um, Cascadia. Was it Occupied Cascadia? Was that the name of the documentary? What was that movie called? Uh... Gosh, I don't even know. I don't remember. Something like that. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're close. Something, something about like, Cascadia. Yeah, something sure. like that. So I guess one thing we'd like to start with, first, how did you get involved in the vegan movement, first of all? How did you get sort of uh, persuaded yeah. to, to try that lifestyle out? I became a vegan in the way that most people become a vegan, which is that they meet a vegan and they are convinced um, by the, you know, the information that you're given by the vegan that this is the best way forward. And I especially, uh, this is very typical, I was 16 years old, and um, teenage girls are the most likely people to try veganism. So I was actually dead average for conversion. So I indeed met another teenage girl who's their entire, her entire family, they were all vegans. And I, in about two weeks, I was, you know, absolutely just on board completely. Um, you know, I had grown up in this very sort of urban suburban environment and I had no idea where my food came from and I hadn't much ever thought about it and they do present a very compelling picture if you are somebody who is at all concerned about the state of the planet um, cruelty to animals injustice generally they they can present you with facts and figures pretty quickly that will convince you that this is the best thing you could ever do for yourself and for the planet and for the animals and for humans and for everybody it's just you know, the best way to get justice for everyone. And I had no counter information. And that's really the problem. Not knowing where my food came from, I had no idea that they were wrong about a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, it's a very complete little world they hand you. So I ran with it. And I did that diet for almost 20 years, completely ground my body into the dirt. Um, I had permanent damage from it. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's my story. Hmm. So, uh, if if you if it's not too uncomfortable, what kind of physical uh, damage was done by the diet? Well, I would say the most severe and lasting damage was that I have degenerate degenerative disc disease in my spine, and people's spines aren't supposed to start falling apart when they're 18 for no reason. Um, yeah, the, you know, I mean, if you look at my MRIs, it looks like I either fell out of an airplane or was in a massive car accident, and I wasn't. But nutritionally, it amounts to the same thing. So that's the number one thing that happened, which that's not really repairable. It did get better. I mean, I'm in a lot less pain than I was. Um, by the time I was done being a vegan, which was 1999, um, I could barely get off the couch. I was in so much pain sitting and standing. Um, and there's really no, there's really nothing they can do for you. You know, when you have this kind of a condition, there's not a lot going forward. I have it at multiple levels. So, um, you know, a fusion is a very bad idea. Um, there's, it's just as like, sorry, pain management is all we've got. So here are some more opioids. And that was pretty much my life at that point. Um, changing to a more appropriate human diet, I did, in fact, reduce my pain level quite significantly. I don't actually think that the tissue has repaired. Once your joints are gone, there's not really any getting them back. But I certainly have a much more active life than I did then, and I'm grateful for that. So you get, you know, you take what miracles you can in this life. So that was the biggest problem. And I have, have at this point, met so many other recovering vegans who ended up with these kinds of chronic joint problems pretty quickly into their vegan lives, some of them with exactly what I have too. So, um, And I understand now why. I mean, I can walk you through nutritionally what is missing that would create that in a human body. Mm -hmm. So that's problem number one. Um, another problem that I developed pretty quickly was also hypoglycemia and really tremendous blood sugar issues. And that, again, is absolutely I – mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. You know, If you're eating a diet that is entirely carbohydrate – uh, the human body was never meant to withstand that load of sugar day in and day out, and you will wear out your insulin receptors. I mean, you're on your way to diabetes the moment you set foot on that path. So that's also pretty permanent. I have to be very, very careful about the amount of carbohydrate that I eat in any day, or I feel really sick. So, you know, that's kind of a done deal as well. Um, I also uh, did tremendous damage to my reproductive organs. Um, I basically didn't menstruate for that entire time, which is very common amongst women who eat low-fat diets of whatever kind. I ended up with uterine fibroids, and I'm pretty sure that was the soy, though I can't prove it. 
Um, that's the phytoestrogen load from the soy, which is really bad for both men and women. It's just not substances we were meant to eat and certainly not in that concentration. Um, so there was that, <laughs> no fun. Um, I also ended up with gastroparesis, which is a condition where uh, I don't produce enough um, acid when I eat, not enough um, hydrochloric acid. And I can walk you through that one as well. It's very common, mostly amongst diabetics, people who have blood sugar issues, but that's going to be pretty much anyone who eats that much carbohydrate um, day in and day out. So there was that. I also ended up with an autoimmune disease. So I have Hashimoto's. And at this point, I probably have two others as well. So all of these are conditions that are really only, they only start surfacing in human beings when we took up agriculture. So they are what we call the diseases of civilization. So all of the autoimmune conditions, all of these kinds of degenerative problems, heart disease, diabetes, um, all of the cancer, all of these fall under that rubric, the diseases of civilization. And that's because hunter-gatherers don't get them. When you eat the diet that we evolved eating, you're going to have a much longer, happier life without these kinds of chronic problems. And it honestly is just that simple. And there's not any debate left about what we evolved eating. I mean, the evidence is so strong. The archaeological evidence, it's all there. Um, but when you're a vegan, you live in this kind of bubble world that has its own origin myth. And you really believe that we somehow evolved as plant eaters. And there's all these stories that you tell each other. And so you end up in this sort of ideological fog all the time about the truth and what the truth is. And you can't absorb alternate information. So that was kind of where I was for 20 years, even as my health failed, you know, sort of wave after wave of bad condition washed over me. I could not face the fact that it was the diet. I mean, not until I was in a state of near complete collapse. Mm. So when did you make the connection that these health failings were the result of the diet? I would say the last maybe five or six years of my vegan life, what happened was everybody that I knew, my friends, my family um, who were vegans, one by one they gave it up because they were all feeling so sick all the time Everybody was really tired of it. You know, we all ended up with really bad chronic health conditions. And one by one, they all started eating meat. Um, some of them told me, some of them didn't until later. Because there's so much shame about it. You know, you feel, you feel so guilty and you feel like you've sold out and you know everybody's going to yell at you. So you don't tell anyone. You just start doing it and you dramatically feel better. Um, so, you know, one by one, I have now heard all their stories. But it was... It was upsetting to me to hear that they were now eating animal products. And also there was another voice in my head saying, you know, this is going to have to be you someday. Like it, it, they're not doing any better than you are. Like they're trying really hard. It's not working. They're telling you for a fact they feel dramatically better eating meat. And I mean, I knew it was sort of in the future, but you can't face that. It's, it's the hardest day of your life. It really was. And I just couldn't. I was the last holdout, really, you know, in that, that group of us that was really hardcore about it. Um, and I'm the one who ended up the worst, you know, the ones who, you know, gave in, you know, who binged, who do what, you know, who actually ate some appropriate human food did a lot better. I mean, I include my sister. She tried really hard for 12 years, 14 years to be a vegan, and she kept eating butter. You know, she kept eating cheese. Like, and finally she started eating fish because her acupuncturist begged her. And she's like, you will feel better, Lier, if you could just give this up. And I couldn't do it. So, I mean, that was, that was sort of, you know, like I knew it was coming in the future and I couldn't face it. And then finally that day comes when you just have to admit this is not working. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you've criticized um, left-wing political movements for is they're sort of being stuck in a juvenile state of developmental thinking. Um, what do you think, if any, that has a relationship to the prevalence of veganism today? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's... I think there's a really important human stage that's adolescence, that's being a teenager. And there are gifts of every age, right? I mean, the, you know, the gift of childhood is just the wonder and the magic and the learning and, you know, all of that. That's just so, we, we love children for that just because they're so innocent and there's so much fun, you know, even there's a lot of work. So that's the downside, but there's something really wonderful about children as well. Um, and for adolescents, the gift of adolescence is that you, you know you have no tolerance for hypocrisy. You just try to see through every lie you're being handed. You know there's this 
cynicism that comes with that age as well that can be incredibly refreshing. And the idealism, I mean, all of that is driven by this just really beautiful, fiery, idealistic passion that you lose as you age, for better and for worse. Like nothing in this world could make me go back to feeling like that every day. But it has, an, there's just an incredible gift to that, to the human race, because they're so often at the forefront of um, important political movements. They're the people who have that kind of fearless courage and are really driven by that passion. Um, the problem is that it also comes with a lot of black and white thinking. You know, it's either good or it's bad. You know, you're evil or you're on our side. And, it, you know, it's so easy to just to get completely in a very bad way, that kind of tribalistic thinking of, you know, you're outside, I'm inside. I mean, just think about high school and what, that, what that's like. And there's like tribal markers, you know, who wears what kind of clothes, what kind of shoes, even the colors matter, you know, and you can immediately tell who's one of us and who's one of them. Um, and, that's the downside of it, and I do feel like a lot of vegans get stuck in that. Mm, mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, the, the sort of deficits in certain proteins and nutrients that we, we would get otherwise from animal products leads to these breakdowns. Now, I think you said the worst, uh, long, most long-lasting damage you sustained was to your discs so uh, in your back. So what kinds of nutrients would animal products have given uh, you if you had been consuming them? that would have prevented your discs from being as uh, worn out as they are. Right. So first of all, minerals, um, you need a fair chunk of minerals every day to have a healthy skeleton, you know, healthy joints, healthy bones, healthy teeth. And in fact, um, a lot of people, even agricultural people who were pre-industrial had way more minerals in their diet. And when you look at some of this, it's astounding you know, how we're even alive, considering the kinds of deficits that we are now living with, because the soil is so worn out, which is something else we can talk about. Um, but hunter-gatherers especially have very, very uh, high amounts of minerals in their diet because they're eating a lot of meat and because they know how to extract the minerals from bones. So they'll eat the bone marrow, you know, it's very, very rich. Um, and most, almost entirely, all, you can say almost across the board, traditional cultures figure out a way to either eat bone or bone, bone broth it was a really great way to extract those minerals. And this is something around the globe that people do um, to increase that mineral load. Um, so right there, you know, if you're only eating a diet that's, you know, essentially carbohydrate, you know, things like wheat and soy and corn, there's just not a lot of minerals in the diet. And this is very clear in the archaeological record. If you look at the skeletons, the teeth of people who you know, the various groups that take up agriculture, you know, starting 10,000 years ago into even more recent times, it's the very first thing that happens to those groups of people is they shrink six inches and their teeth start falling out. And you can look very, very short period before that, you know, it'll be the same group, the same region, and their time as hunter-gatherers, they have, as usual, is perfect dentition. They have skeletons that show no sign of these kinds of deficiency diseases. Anemia, iron deficiency anemia shows up very dramatically in skeletons. Um, there's a number of diseases, that disease states that are created by that, and they're very, very obvious to archaeologists. It's, this is not something that anybody fights about. Like, it's really clear to archaeologists. Like, immediately they can tell you whether it was the bone of a hunter-gatherer or the bone of a, an agriculturalist, and that's one of the main ways they can tell. The agricultural bones are, are really short and brittle, and they're riddled with these kinds of diseases, where the hunter-gatherer bones are long and strong and disease-free. They may show periodic um, uh, times of hunger, so they'll get, uh, there'll be these lines, that are bows lines, sometimes they're called, that are lines in the, either the, the, where the enamel is laid down the teeth or actually in the bones themselves, and that means for a month or two they didn't get enough to eat. So growth stops. Um, but then it picks up again, and they're, and they're laying down minerals again because they have enough to eat. So you will see that periodically amongst hunter-gatherers, and that makes sense. Winter comes, right? You know, you have March, April. You know, there's not a lot of food left. Animals are thin. You're not getting enough fat, not a lot to eat out there. You might have these periods of, of hunger, but it's shared by the whole group, and, you know, it, everything is fine again once there's, there's food again. Um, so the minerals, that's a, a, a big one. There's no way you can get enough minerals eating simply grain. It's not going to happen. They're just not nutrient-dense like that. Another problem is that in order for human beings to absorb minerals in your digestive tract, you actually have to eat them with a fair amount of fat. Um, that's actually how our digestion is designed, and we can't do it without fat. So if you're eating these um, low-fat diets, like that kind of vegan diet that I was on, 
no matter how many minerals you're trying to consume, you're not going to absorb them without the fat. And this is a real problem. And this is one of the reasons why you've got all these women with osteoporosis in rich countries. I mean, this should not, it's a deficiency disease and it shouldn't happen to anybody who's got enough food. And yet, find all these women who have it. And that's why they've been eating these low fat diets now for 40 or 50 years. And there's no way to absorb the minerals. So that's another problem with the diet. Another, another problem with the minerals is that if you're eating whole grain, which of course I was, I was a super pure vegan. I never touched white flour. It was only whole beans, whole grains. Um, the problem is you have to remember what grains and beans are. They are the babies of plants. Okay. This, that they're all seeds. So the plant provides their young with ways to defend themselves because the plant itself can't really do it anymore. So like any good parent, it tries to provide its babies with protection. And one of the ways that seeds protect themselves is they have what are called anti-nutrients. So they're coated with a whole bunch of different substances that make them very hard to digest. And that's their protection. That's the only thing they've got to keep animals from eating them. So some of these things are out and out toxic. Um, there's a lot of things you and I would never eat in a forest or on a prairie because we know better. <laughs> Um, you, you know, you will die if you eat them. Um, and that's a lot of seeds. They're just out and out toxic. Um, but the things that we have domesticated, the things that we have learned to try to eat, they still come with quite a load of these anti-nutrients. And one of the kinds of anti-nutrients you will find in seeds, whatever kind, in grains and in beans, um, they are called phytates or phytic acid. And they literally bind with minerals in your digestive tract and they suck them out of your body so you can't use them. Um, and that's one way that plants defend themselves from us. They say, well, all right, you can eat us, but we're going to make you sick and debilitated so you can't have children and are small and weakly and can't walk around and don't eat us anymore. So that's one thing they do. There are ways that you can pre-treat. Uh, if you're going to eat things like whole grains and beans, there are things you can do to lower the phytate load, but I didn't know that when I was a vegan, and I think most vegans still don't know that. Um, it's a fairly onerous process. You have to soak them and then dry them. Um, you're tricking the seed into thinking, oh, guess what? You can sprout now. Conditions are correct. And in the process of starting to sprout, it disables the phytates. So they become more, there are more nutrients available, and they stop doing that kind of anti-nutrient thing to us if you do that. So traditional foods like sourdough bread, you know, that usually takes three or four days to make, and that's why. It's it's a long process of, you know, fermentation at room temperature, and there are this is one of the reasons that people around the globe make that kind of food. is Whether they had chemistry labs or not, and they didn't, uh, they knew that it was healthier to eat it this way, and, and they're correct in that, and that's one of the reasons why, is it disables those anti-nutrients. But back to my life, I didn't know that. And so I was eating every day these whole grains and whole beans. So any tiny bit of minerals that I did get, of course, I couldn't absorb because they were being sucked out of my body. So, you know, that big problems right there. So that's the minerals. You got more problems with things like bones and teeth because vitamin D, of course, is essentially creates the matrix around um, any place where you're going to build up uh, minerals. So your bones and your teeth and your joints, they all need that. And without vitamin D, you can't really do it correctly. And the, the most dramatic deficiency disease with vitamin D, of course, is rickets, which we don't see really in the first world anymore, except there are two exceptions to this. And one is very dark-skinned children living in very northern climates will get rickets because they're not getting enough, you know, the, the sunshine is mm -hmm. one way that we get it is sunshine on your skin will stimulate vitamin D production and they just can't do it. So you have to be a little bit careful if you're a very dark colored person in a very cold environment, you're probably gonna to have to supplement. So that's one, one set of people who get that. But the other set is vegans. Uh, the children of vegans are known to get rickets. Um, there was one study done in Boston, Massachusetts where they followed the health status of all these vegan children and in the winter time, um, almost 50% of them showed signs of, of out and out rickets. And that should terrify people. I mean, that's yeah. just, there's no reason for that. That's permanent. Like you do that kind of damage to your bones. It's those kids could be, you know, forever have problems with their legs. I mean, we're used to, you know, tiny Tim and Charles Dickens. And we, we even have, you know, that we, we say something is Dickensian when it's just that horrible, you know, poverty and squalor, but 
you know, there it is. You know, people think they're doing the right thing, but they're, they're doing permanent damage to their children with this diet. And that's strictly the lack of vitamin D. We know what causes rickets. It's vitamin D. So without that, you just you can't lay down the, you know, the minerals into, into the bone that you need. And there are no plant sources of vitamin D. You can only get it eating animals. Um, it's only an animal fat. Vitamin A is, is similar. You can only get it um, from animal animal foods. The uh, vitamin A that you can get from plants is not a fully formed vitamin A that humans can use. It's a, it's, it's a precursor to vitamin A, to actual vitamin A. And to do that conversion, you need an enzyme. And there's a fair number of human beings who simply lack that enzyme. If you are from, if your genetic background, your ethnic background is people who are coastal people or island people, um, it could be you. Because if you have been eating fish, seafood for a long time, uh, it just evolutionarily, they stopped making that enzyme because they didn't need it. There was so much vitamin A in the diet. So these people are obligate carnivores. There is no question. If you are one of those human beings, you will die eventually if you don't eat vitamin A. And the only place you're going to get it is from animal products. Um, I know some people like this. Uh, I may be one of them. I don't know. Um, but it's, there's, there's no question. So this is a known scientific medical fact about some people. So if you're Irish or, you know, you're from Polynesia or, you know, any number of coastal areas, it's something to look into if, if you're still trying to be a vegan, it's, you know, this may be one reason why you're feeling very sick. So that's vitamin A, vitamin D, only available in animal products. K2 is another vitamin. You can get it from, from some plant sources, but the best sources, again, the really dense sources are always going to be the animal fats. So those are fat soluble vitamins. They only come in fats and those fats really have to be animal fats. So there's that. Um, and then another problem is just simply the protein. The, uh, the, the proteins that you get from plant foods are just not complete. Um, and we used to think like way back in the day when I started doing this, there was this sort of idea that you could quote, combine your protein. So if you ate rice and beans, that was somehow a complete protein because what the rice was missing, the beans would provide. And altogether, it made a nice, complete picture. It turns out that's not really true. Now that they can do radioactive tagging of your food, they have done these experiments on human beings. And when proteins actually go through your digestive tract, they're not broken down into um, very discrete amino acids. They actually come in little chunks. And therefore, they can't really combine correctly with other little chunks. It doesn't actually work the way that you know people in 1970 hoped that it would so that we could all be vegetarians. So um, even if you do your best to try to combine all these proteins, it's not going to work. And yeah. the other problem with this is that um, plant proteins come wrapped in cellulose. That's what plants are made of. That's what their bodies are, is cellulose. And we don't really have a mechanism to digest cellulose. So even if you do everything in your power, you know, to try to eat the absolute best, highest, whatever, quality plant proteins, you just can't absorb it. We don't have a way to break down that cellulotic wall and get into that stuff, you know, the protein that's in there. We aren't ruminants. You know, ruminants are the people who figured out how to do that millions of years ago. And they have an incredible digestive tract that will do that for them. But we are not those people. And, we, you know, we're not the animals that figured that out. We went a different path. We're carnivores. And you know, we just can't get the, what we need out of plants. We can't get protein, enough protein out of that. So um, in a nutshell, I would say that was pretty much what did in my spine was a combination of those things. This is all exacerbated by eating soy. I don't know if you want me to do a soy gig here, but Go ahead. Um, soy is just ghastly on every level. Um, and one of the main problems with soy is that it has a very high level of phytates. <clears throat> and no matter how much pretreatment you give to soy, there will always be a very high load of that in the soy. And in the places in the world where they do eat soy, you'll know if they eat it as a condiment, they don't eat it as a protein source. So there will be miso in soup, for instance. And that seems to me the only appropriate way to eat soy. Um, or tamari, you know, it's a condiment. You know, you sprinkle a little bit on for flavor. But when that stuff is made traditionally, it is fermented for months, if not years. And that's, again, why. You know, whether or not they had microscopes and could figure it out, Traditionally, people understood that these were substances that had to be treated for a very, very long time to make them edible. Um, so, you know, miso soup or whatever. And y you also note that when they eat miso in soup, it's with bone broth and, and it's fish broth in particular. That's how miso soup is traditionally served. So here you've got, you know, a substance that 
potentially it's going to drain minerals from your body. So if we're going to eat it, let's make sure we get the highest density mineral substance we can think of, which would be fish broth. So they'll put those two things together, and that's you know the sort of traditional wisdom of some island peoples. They somehow understood that. In what, in wherever they got this wisdom, they figured that out. Maybe it was just observation over centuries, who knows. But that's how it was traditionally eaten. They didn't eat huge chunks of it every day as a protein source. Um, the only people who did that traditionally in Japan were actually the monks. And it's very clear in the historic record. They understood that it suppressed their sex drive. And that's the phytoestrogens. And thus, it was easier to be a young man who was a monk because obviously you're going to struggle living a celibate life as a young person you know, with sex hormones, it's just something that you struggle with as a monk. But this is, you know, it's absolutely going to be helped if you're eating, guess what, huge chunks of soy, because the phytoestrogens will, you know, do its, you know, do its worst on, on your testosterone levels. So and is that in part why uh, the neoplatonic aesthetics advocated veganism over eating meat? I would assume that was in there, yes, because it absolutely will. The other, problem, the other thing to remember is that all of your hormones, including your sex hormones, are made from cholesterol. Okay, so cholesterol has been so vilified, this poor substance is an absolutely life-giving substance, and every last one of your hormones is made from it. So if you're eating a low-fat diet and not eating any cholesterol, you're not going to have enough hormones of any kind. And what your body says is, okay, so... We're in this sort of critical state. We don't have enough building blocks to make the hormones that we need. Moment to moment, what is most important? Let's pull out. This is triage here, people. The most important things are day-to-day -day life. We're going to keep that going. Reproduction, we're going to worry about that later. When there's more food, we can talk about that again. Sorry, sex hormones. You know, in a year or two, we'll talk to you again. But for right now, we're just keeping this system alive. And so what happens is you stop producing sex hormones. On these low-fat diets, these no-cholesterol diets, happens to men, happens to women, but it's one reason we know for a fact that ballerinas and female athletes stop menstruating. Like, they're just not producing sex hormones, right? Because they're eating these low-fat diets, they don't have enough body fat to fall back on, and bingo, you know, you, you, you stop. You stop being a fertile person, and the same is true for men. Um, and so, yes, you will see this crash in people's sex drives, um, you know, and just that, that feeling of just being alive, you know, just ebbs away out of your body. The, um, ir the ironic thing is that PETA advertisers veganism will do the opposite. And it's such a joke. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. This is such basic human biology. I just can't believe anybody falls for it. Every time I see one of those ads, I just want to bang my head against a wall. It's just insanity. It just like, bears no relation to reality is what I'm trying to get mm -hmm. at. Now, one thing that you, you've brought up before, and I think it's interesting in, about plants because um, a lot of vegans will say, well, we shouldn't eat animals because they're sentient. But plants aren't, so it's okay to eat plants. But what you're saying is, well, not so fast. Plants are to some extent sentient. Plants do incredible things, and the more we learn about them, the more we see that they make decisions, they help each other, they make communities. Um, I'll give you one really great example. I live in the redwoods in Northern California, and there are albino redwoods. So you think of a tree, they're green. Well, they lack the pigment to turn the correct color. So they're kind of a gray-white color. And what that means is they can't photosynthesize. I mean, the reason trees look green ultimately is because of you know, the compounds that let them photosynthesize. And these trees can't do that. There's a, you know, it's a genetic mutation, essentially, just like white deer or albino mice or whatever. They, it's the same thing. But in the case of trees, of course, without that, they will die. I mean, they have no way to get energy out of the sun. But these trees are alive. Now, they'll never get as big as a regular redwood. They're about half the size. But how are they alive? And the reason they're alive is because the trees around them, the other redwoods, all of their roots are connected up. They communicate through their roots all the time. And the other trees in the community send them nutrients. And that's what keeps them alive. So it's like us feeding our children. You know, it's like, all right, well, obviously you're sending out distress calls. You're hungry. I hear that. Here's some food. And they will all send in their roots. They will send the correct nutrients to the trees that can't produce them. Um, and that's extraordinary that trees do that. It's also um, reported that when you cut grass, the smell of a cut grass is actually a kind of biochemical distress call. Yes, very uh, true. Yeah. So, so when the vegan says, well, the cow can't talk to you and tell you that it hurts being eaten, but it's still expressing pain or some sort of threat, 
Well, plants do that too. And they do. And in fact, there's amazing things that plants do. And for instance, you know, in a woodland situation, uh, a large ruminant will pass through like a deer, say, and that causes some damage to the plants. You know, there's no way around it. Twigs break, branches bend. It's no fun. Um, it's a scary situation because plants can't run. Um, so, you know, a, a plant will sustain some kind of a wound from something like a deer passing through. And that plant will then send out calls to all the other plants um, you know, in the area to say, watch out, big ruminant coming. And all of the other plants will then immediately send compounds out into their branches and into their, you know, whatever they've got, their twigs um, that are stiffening compounds to give them a little more strength so that if the deer comes that way, they're more prepared for the assault. Um, so it's that kind of thing all the time. The more we learn about plants, the more that we see that they are just these incredible beings. Um, they can't run like we can. So they've had to develop a whole other arsenal of ways to communicate and protect themselves. So they're essentially like nature's biochemical warfare specialists because it's all about the chemicals. It's how they communicate. It's how they do things. It's how they protect themselves, uh, how they send out messages to each other. Um, and it's a really complex and amazing. It's very awe-inspiring. Like, wow, all that is going on out there, and I had no idea. But, I, I mean, there's – I. I can't draw a line and say, oh, I'm sentient and these other creatures aren't. I mean, we owe our entire existence to all of these creatures, and we don't even know the basics about how they survive and the relationships they form and that whole web of life that makes us possible. I mean, we're like a little bit of decoration on top of the icing on top of the cake, you know? And we think of ourselves as so important, but we're not, and we need to be humble about that. You know, we're only here because of the work of so many other species, and this is where that whole hierarchy falls apart for me. And it was hard for me as a vegan because I tried to draw that line and say, well, these are the creatures that matter and I don't want to do harm to them. But what it meant was all these other creatures don't matter and aren't as important, so therefore I am allowed to eat them. And I never could sit well with that. And the more that I investigated plants and the more that I tried to grow my own food and got my hands in the dirt and understood soil and tried to grow things, the more I learned that that was not a line that made any sense. Like, it was all alive. I mean, one tablespoon of soil contains over a million different living creatures. And my life was utterly dependent on those. And it was just, I, I like, that whole framework just had to crumble for me in the end. And I had to say, you know what, it's all alive. And no matter what I eat, something's dying. There's no way out of that cycle. And that was the problem. I tried to get out, but there's no way out. One of the things that's interesting is that distinction that the vegans make. Uh, what they're doing, they think they're rebelling against the Christian worldview that they rejected, but in fact, they're holding on to a part of it. Yeah, the Greek part especially. Cause that well, that's it. I mean, that was the ancient Greek thing. was like, okay, there's a substrata that's like just rock, and then there's plants that are okay, a little bit alive, and then, you know, like all the way up to humans. And it's like, you're doing the same thing. You're just making this hierarchy of who counts and who doesn't. And, but you're the people who say you don't want that hierarchy. You're, all you've done is extend it a little bit to animals, but you're still not seeing like just the, the depth of life on this planet and how dependent we are and the fact that no matter what you do, some of those creatures have to die to feed you. There's no way out of that. And it was, it was like an incredible relief to accept that as well as an incredible sadness to me. And I do feel like that was the moment that I grew up. I just became an adult. I assumed my responsibilities on this planet. Like, all right, well, I, I'm going to have to kill to survive. That's always been true. I just didn't want to face it. Now I face it. All right, now I can at least do it well. And that's all we can do is just do it well. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned uh, – well, actually, you had mentioned. I was going to mention this. <laughs> is um, the whole – actually, no, you did mention it. It was in the Cascadia documentary. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, from the environmentalist uh, point of view, the dirty little secret is a lot of this stuff is based on the oil capitalist economy that people uh, that you like that you run with are trying to dismantle. And right. it's, it's interesting because the vegans will say, well, we can have all these supplements. These supplements that they take that are not animal products are synthesized using the oil economy and that – they're saying, well, look, we don't want to hurt the animals, so we're not going to eat them, but we'll then destroy their environment with the oil economy. It's kind of contradictory there, you know? Well, I, I would even step it back further than the oil economy and talk about the nature of agriculture itself. And this was something I had a very hard time grappling with during my time as a vegan. 
um, because you have to understand what agriculture is. So you take a piece of land and then you clear every living thing off it. And I mean down to the bacteria, that life-giving bacteria. You know, the people who are doing the, the really basic work of life are the bacteria on this planet. All of that gets cleared off. And then you plant that land only for humans. So you only grow humans on it. So all those plants and animals and all those little microorganisms, they literally have nowhere else to go. And that's a long-winded way of saying extinction, mass extinction. We are now losing 200 species every single day. And it's the agriculturalists who have done this. It's not the hunter-gatherers. They lived as part of their environment. We destroy our, our environment to only support humans. And that's the problem with agriculture right there. We have now skinned the planet alive. There's no topsoil left. We've been eating oil since 1950 because all the topsoil is gone. Um, and that was something that I had a terrible time understanding as a vegan because I wanted to believe this was like peaceful, nonviolent, sustainable food. And that's just completely not true. It's the most destructive thing people have done to the environment because it's biotic cleansing. I mean, we, you know, we know about ethnic cleansing where one group of people pushes another group off and just, you know, destroys them all, you know, kills them all. It's, they're no longer there. Well, it's biotic cleansing. It's every last living thing is cleared off that land. Um, and we have now destroyed 98% of the old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies are gone. And the main reason that we did that was for agriculture. Um, and so in the meantime, of course, our population has grown to extraordinary numbers that can never be sustained. You know, the only reason we are all here is because they figured out how to make usable fertilizer out of nitrogen you know, from, from oil and gas. And that's what we've been eating since 1950 is oil and gas. And the crash is inevitable. Um, I mean, I get yelled at all the time. Oh, you want to kill 6 billion people. It's like, I don't want to kill 6 billion people. I'm pointing out where this ends so that we can try to take control of this situation, steer the boat in a better direction while there's still time, because that is inevitable. I mean, the, the topsoil ran out. Well, the oil and the gas is going to run out too at some point, you know, like it doesn't reproduce. And so none of that seems obvious to the vegans. It's obvious to me now, but it was not obvious to me, you know, during my time as my tenure as a vegan, it became obvious. And it was one of those terrible things that I grappled with when I realized that this was not a sustainable way to live. It was very difficult. Now, when you sort of, you know, left, you know, when people realized you weren't a vegan anymore and the, the people that you ran with who were vegans, presumably they thought you were a sellout and a traitor or something like that to some extent, correct? Yeah, you lose friends. There's no way around it. It's a it's a hard time. I get that. It's about a year and a half where you have to accept you're, you're, you're a new person now. Your whole identity collapses. It's very hard, and you are going to lose at least some of your social circle, and some of them very viciously will turn on you. And, and every vegan who writes to me knows that. Every last one of them is terrified of that. I mean, it just shows you the kind of mindset of the, the culture that's been created around this, and it's not a healthy place. Well, what's interesting is that the vegan thinks that they're resisting the corporate structure, but they're living a life that can only be maintained by the corporate structure. Correct. Correct. And, and, and really, that's kind of the kind of that's exactly the kind of opposition the corporate structure wants to have. I know, right? Because they think that they're rebelling, and in fact, they're not. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's kind of an irony for the vegans. But the sort of like shore up your cred, you've been involved in the not that you don't need to, but just for the other vegans that might be listening, <laughs> uh, you know, is that. You're involved in the environmental movement, and I saw your your doc, the documentary that you were in on Cascadia, the bioregionalism. That was an interesting uh, documentary. So why don't you explain what bioregionalism is and, and how you got in, interested in it? Well, I think the, the general idea of bioregionalism is that we live in one place, and that's the place that we are connected. You know, that's the place that we know. It's the place that we love. It's the place where our ancestors are buried. It's the place where you know, our water is from, our food is from. And the only way to have a human scale society is to have it be to human scale. It has to be, you know, the place that you could walk to, you know, in a few days. That makes sense. That's a human scale. Um, a thousand miles away is not something that makes sense to human beings. I mean, it's not something that you can do easily. You know, it takes months to walk that far and you may die along the way. Um, but your home place, you know, it's some place you could walk to in a few days. That makes sense. And that's the scale at which we lived pretty much for our first two million years on the planet. Um, because that's kind of the area that, you know, you, you could know the trees, you could know the animals, you could know the rivers, you know, you could know the seasons, you could know what food to expect. Um, and that's how you're going to survive. So 
It's the place you know, it's the place you love, and it's the place you'll protect because it's your home. Um, and all of that makes sense. Um, it's really the only way to have a just society as well because um, you have to rely on that place. It means you'll protect it. If you are reliant on importation from some other area, you are inevitably, inevitably going to end up a militarized society because those people aren't going to want to give up their land, their water, their trees, their soil. The only way you're going to get that stuff from them is if you take it by force. So if you're reliant on something from somewhere else, you are ultimately dependent on some kind of a military barricade to keep you safe. Um, and, you know, that's the situation we find ourselves in. We may not know it because we live in one of the really wealthiest countries, but we do live behind a military barricade. And, you know, our corporations are extracting all kinds of resources from around the world so that we can live these incredibly lush lifestyles. Um, and we have no idea where this stuff comes from or what the human cost is or what the ecological cost is. So I think the idea behind bioregionalism was that the only way to have a sustainable world and the only way to have a just world was to bring it back to a region that makes sense to human scale so that you saw the damage if you did these things. Does anybody really want an asbestos mine in their backyard? And the answer is no. That's always going to be pushed on the poorest people, the most powerless people, because it's utterly hellacious to breathe that stuff in. So if it was you and your kids who had to breathe it, you would say no, right? So, you know, why are we producing it at all? Well, we're producing it because people are so poor that they're desperate enough to say yes, and the people who do protest it are sometimes you know, violently killed by various, you know, militaries around the world. Um, and that's how we get stuff like that, that that's, you know, mined and utterly toxic to the environment. Um, and we don't know that because it's not happening in our backyards. And the reason it's not is because we're wealthy people. So all of that was like a way to say, well, we have to, these are the practices that have to stop. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we, we go back to that bioregional scale so that we see the damage, we know the damage, we won't do the damage if it's, if it's us, if it's our trees, our water, our food. Um, and I guess that's the hope of it. And, and really that is how we lived for millions of years before we did all this destruction to our planet, when we lived in harmony more or less with each other, but certainly with the planet. You know, it was it was that human scale kind of community and that human scale level of consumption. So so when you, how old were you when you got into the environmental movement? Oh, I would have been a teenager, you know, 16, 17 and um, somewhere in there. Yeah. I mean, I have to say I was somebody who always cared about that kind of thing. That I, you know, I cried when trees were cut down. I remember when the last meadow was turned into a housing development in my neighborhood. Um, smokestacks just traumatized me beyond speech like when I saw you know smoke billowing out that horrible black stuff billowing out driving by oil refineries it just looked like hell on earth and so I mean I, I was always somebody who like just on an instinctual level got that my planet was being wrecked slowly so I can imagine that uh, you, you probably uh, really uh, enjoyed in the two towers when the trees tear down the industrial center of oh. Isengard you have no idea. I mean, and those books were so, I had those books read out loud to me as a child. I mean, I was eight, nine, ten when I read those books and just absolutely formative. I mean, just, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because a lot of environmentalists who you would not necessarily expect, because Tolkien is a very arch-traditionalist, arch-conservative, like the, the, the Lord of the Rings, and in large part because of his sort of pastoral, almost proto-environmentalist attitude towards the world. Well, he actually said, I mean, in his in his own words, he said that um, the uh, internal combustion engine was the worst thing to ever befall the human race. And he said, perhaps our only hope is in the bomb throwing mustachioed men, by which he meant sort of, you know, radical socialist anarchist type people who were willing to do what was necessary because he saw how his, you know, his beloved rural England was being wrecked. I, I think he called the, the internal combustion engine a Mordor machine or something. Yes, I mean, he got that. He absolutely saw, and he'd seen World War One and World War Two, and you know he saw the hell that was being yeah. created, industrialization. So that's in those books. There's no question. And you'll note that the, the creatures that are the immortals, the elves, are the hunter gatherers. I mean, he got that too. Like that's in there. Now the, the okay, beautiful sorry. part at the end too. No, I'm just I'm, I could go on about this forever. But you'll remember how Sam Ganji gets the. Um, the little bit of topsoil, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and he brings it back. You know, he's able to restore. You know, the Hobbit, the Shire, uh -huh. just been wrecked by those horrible people who came when they were, you know, when the Hobbits when they had gone off to fight, and it's you know been destroyed by this terrible hierarchy again, which is essentially doing you know like industrial agriculture in the Shire, and he's able to restore the land. And I, 
Tolkien saw that. I mean, he got the, how the importance of the topsoil. It's it's even that level of detail is in the book. If you know what you're looking for, you can find it. So I w- would would it be fair to say that the restoration of Hobbiton and the scouring of the Shire would be sort of like a bioregionalist attempt to, to to organize society? Yeah, I actually don't think that that's far off. I think that that's actually I think that's a sort of a utopian vision that a lot of us would agree with. Yeah, because if you look at the Middle Earth, I didn't plan on talking about it, but I love Middle Earth, so this is great. Um, but one of the things is there is a there is a very strong uh, current with the trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see, I don't know if you've read the Silmarillion, but there were the two trees, the silver and the golden tree planted in the land of the immortals. And then they take one of the seeds of those trees to Gondor, and then yeah. the, the elves take some of those seeds and plant them in the elven woods. And we see... It's interesting too because he, when he talks about the trees, he talks about them like they're like they're a genealogy, like you have with like kings. Because it says, mm-hmm. "Oh yeah, the tree in Gondor has this paternity going all the way back to the land of the immortals." That's a very interesting thing that you really don't see anywhere. Yeah, you know, well, in, he, in fiction, he was, a, he, was a, he was a folklorist too. I mean, he was really into all kinds of mythology, and it. You know, he got a lot of that from sort of European, you know, what we know about European paganism. It's there, you know, this, this that real love for the, the tree, the, the elders that are, are the trees. And it's that's a beautiful part of those books. And it had a huge impact on me as a child. Now, you said they were read to you a lot when you were 10, you said? Yeah, yeah. And 8, 9, 10 in there. My mother read them out loud to us. Oh, yeah. That, I, I might, unfortunately for me, I probably lose my geek cred for it, but I read it because of the movies. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Well, I mean, at least you got to it, so it's all right. When, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I got to it. And, and, yeah, it's way better than the movies. But I think a lot of people, though, the utility of the movies, at least, is this, is that people that would never otherwise have heard of it, heard of it. Yeah, and they really should read the books because the, the things that they change and that they had to leave out in the, in the movies, there's some very, very key elements that simply aren't there. And, of course, those of us who really love those books, I mean, yeah. I got mad, very mad about some of it, but – I, I do think it's important. Oh, think, yeah. Especially that that children will read these books, and I, I think it's well worth the effort. And, I mean, they the stuff that they did well in those movies, they did really beautifully. Like, the detail, the level mm-hmm. of detail was, I just think, it was beautiful. You know, the just the sets and the costumes were gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. With um, one of the things I think, well, there's a couple things that I that really stick out is the bad parts of the movie. But when Treebeard, what are the really bad parts is he doesn't initially want to fight Saruman. I'm like, what? He right from the get go, he's he's like, let's go take this guy out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, that was uh, uh, there's some thematic reason for that, but I don't think it was a very good reason. But I think leaving out the scouring of the Shire is hugely a mistake because there's yeah. so much that the story is building up to that. The scouring of the Shire represents. It represents the fact that nothing is unstained by the evil of Sauron. It brings out that the hobbits were being trained to take uh, take charge of their own affairs. Yeah. And right. of course, it was a part of Tolkien's broader anti-industrial narrative. Yeah. yeah no, I knew they were going to do that too. It's like you bet. It just ends with, oh, the ring is gone, and now we're going to celebrate, and then Frodo will go off into the west, and that's going to be the end of it. They're going to leave out that whole last segment, which just seems so key to me. In reading the books, and they did, of course, which oh, yeah. did okay. They, they couldn't make four movies; they had to make three. They're gonna chop stuff off, but please read the books if you haven't read the books. <laughs> well, probably one of the things that really upset me was it left out Tom Bombadil. Yeah, I know, right? All of that. Yep. I mean, yeah. oh, my it, mother, my mother was so angry about Tom Bombadil. <laughs> well, because it's interesting. I mean, Tom Bombadil and Goldbear are essentially uh, nature spirits. No, absolutely, yeah. Um, and his his sort of he just almost seems out of place, but he still fits somehow. Right. Yeah. He's he's in the mythology somewhere in that world. He's one of the, you know, the sort of otherworldly creatures that sort of come and go. Yeah. So we're about nearing the end of the time allotted. Is there anything you want to end with? Um, I don't think that our situation is hopeless. I, I certainly know people who feel like too many tipping points have been reached but I don't think so. I think that the ruminants and the grasses working together, it's still, it's not too late. They really could still sequester all the carbon. I mean, we could, if we even, if we could repair 75% of the world's trashed out grasslands, it would take about 15 years, but the grasses would sequester 
um, all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age, which is an extraordinary statement, but it's true. And that's what grasses do. They build soil. And if we would just let them do their job, um, I, I don't think it's too late. Even if it is ends up that it is too late, I don't actually intend to give up. Um, I don't really understand the point of that kind of despair. I, I think that we have to, to the very end, I intend to go down fighting. So I don't really, you know, I'm a Frodo kind of person. So <laughs> I'm going to get that ring and that mountain if there's any way to do it. So, yeah, you know, hopefully there's some Sam Ganges out there willing to help. But I, I just I just think morally we have to keep fighting no matter what. And I don't think the solutions are that difficult. It's nothing technological. We simply let the world come back to life. It will come back. It wants to live. Like more than anything, it fiercely wants to live. So those grasses and those ruminants could do the job. And, you know, there's certainly the things that we have to do politically and socially. But this problem is not a physical problem. It's not a problem of chemistry. It's not a problem of biology. You know, it's very specific human actions that have brought this about. And there are very specific human actions that could stop it. And, you know, one of them is just simply stop the destruction. The world will come back to life and it will reassert that balance. So don't give up. You know, whatever despair you may be faced with in your heart and your soul, it's never too late. And, and life will find a way if we just give it a tiny chance. So what, you're saying we don't need central planners to save the carbon? No. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the libertarians, maybe that could be a way where the libertarians and the far left can find some agreement there. Well, really, I mean, we really could just do it farm by farm. You know, if we could just let the Midwest and the other, you know, massive grassland destructions that have happened across the planet – it's actually, I mean, okay, we're going to get off on an aside here, but the thing about grass-based farming, you know, whether you're raising bison or whether you're using beef cows, whatever it is, I don't even care at this point, your very first year as a grass-based farmer, you can make a living. This, you know, you can compare that to the poor people who are essentially serfs trying to raise grain for the grain cartels because, you know, there are six corporations that control the world grain supply, mm -hmm. and the farmers that have to work for them. I mean, it's the number one cause of death is suicide for those people because their lives are so miserable. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about India or the United States. It's just absolutely wretched what is happening to them year after year. But if they can switch, if they understand the concept and they can switch to grass-based farming, restore those native grasses, put appropriate ruminants on it, the very first year they have made a profit. That's how much that stuff is worth. You know, what, what people are willing to pay for really good a really good meat supply. So, I mean, on one level, it's like, this could be done, and in fact, it wouldn't even cost money. Like, this actually is the way people could make a living while they restore the planet, and it's really simple. Like, these are not actually difficult solutions. This is why, you know, there's a level of frustration that I think a lot of us feel, because we don't need some giant geoengineering project. We just need grass and bison. They'll do it for us while they feed us. Like, what could be better? Well... Thank you for coming on. It was a very interesting conversation. This is Todd Lewis yeah. of the Praise of Folly podcast signing off.